evening, everybody. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, the evening edition, with my co-host, Randy Cardoon. Oh, he's oh, been hello. There he is. There. And special guest, Berkeley Comstock tonight. Going to be talking hey, about some great, some great photography he does. Already logged in and preparing to be harassed is my wife, Peg, and Marlon Mitchell. She so, gives as good as she gets, let oh, me tell you. Oh, boy, does she ever. <laughs> All right, so you've got gas, the evening edition. Remember, folks, this will be on YouTube if you're not already watching. Well, you're not already here. You don't see anybody here. Do you see anybody here? I don't see anybody here. Anyway, we're recording this. It'll be on YouTube in just a day or so, and it'll be on Facebook as well as Blogger, Pinterest, and other places as we put it up, and I'll list those on our regular Facebook page. They have videos on Pinterest? Yes, every morning I put a video on Pinterest. Really? Okay. Yes. I, what are Randy, you looking at on Pinterest? I like to know. I what am I looking at? I'm not on I'm not. Pinterest. I'm posting this on Pinterest. Huh? Uh huh. And trailers. Is it Pinterest okay. or Pinterest? Or Pininterest? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just. Does it matter? Matter? I'm not on it, so it doesn't. You're not matter. on it. All right. No, so no. We'll, we'll get our English Twitter, lesson. Wherever, things, so. whatever. Yeah. Yes. All right. So Berkeley, tell us a little bit about what you do, and uh, if you can share some of the examples. You're a photographer, and you've taken some great shots, from what I understand, of racing in action. Yes. So I actually am a photographer for Buttonwillow Raceway, and I am contracted under Cali Photography. Um, we are a photography company that does photography of race groups along with track days for most of the circuit tracks of Southern California. Um, we've got tons of photographers. My home track is actually Buttonwall Raceway. So I've done everything from VARA to SCCA to track days to bikes to a little bit of everything. So, uh, that's about it. We, we've been shooting there for God, probably about eight years now. And I've been working with them for about six. All right. So why don't you give us a little bit of your background? How did you get started doing the photography? So I actually have my bachelor in fine arts and that's actually when I started photography, even kind of taking it seriously at all. I had, um, had a class there and got got the basics of photography and after i graduated i answered the weirdest craigslist ad i had ever answered <laughs> and it was a craigslist ad for a photography position working at the racetrack which seemed way too good to be true and i wasn't going to answer the email because it seemed like every other spam uh arts position in Kern County. Um, but there was a phone number. So I went ahead and called and I actually ended up speaking to the owner of the company and he's like, Hey, can you come out here next weekend? And I was like, yeah, sure. And he's like, all right, cool. We'll, we'll do an interview then. So we set up a time and everything. And I, I got all set up for an interview and I got there. And there was a really skinny dude with a really big hat and covered in sunburn. And he's sitting there and he goes, I just got in. I was running around outside and I was just do, going to do this and doing that. And it's really nice to meet you. And how do you, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And he's just going a mile a minute and I'm trying to catch up with this guy. <laughs> and halfway through the interview, he goes, Hey, do you mind if I eat? <laughs> and I go, uh, no. <laughs> Did he at and least offer to give you some food? He had a granola bar, <laughs> and that's about all he ate. But he's sitting there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Breakfast of champion. <laughs> he ate like this? He, he, was, he was going after it. Okay. Um, <laughs> and after about 35 or 40 minutes, he goes, cool. Seems like you're a good fit. You like cars, you like motorcycles, you've built a motorcycle, like you know what's going on. You want to go shoot some photography? And I go, uh, sure. Mind you, I'm in like my nice dress pants and like my button down shirt and it's 110. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and he drug me out to the side of the track and went, 
okay, stand right there. And it was about a foot away from cars going about 70. Mm. And he went, just go ahead and shoot some photos. And we started then, and that's when I started my, my training was the same day I got hired. So did he provide the camera? Yeah, did he provide the camera, or did you have to bring your own equipment? It, so uh, for the company, we have all of our own equipment dedicated to each track. So they have cameras there. We've got backups of everything, and everything's there on site. For private stuff, I have my own camera, but it's a, a different setup than what we need at the track. Driving down the freeway, I mean, you could have gone by the 101 and done the same thing. Just sit there and take shots as they went by. I mean, it would have been perfect. Especially well, today, no one would notice. No one would notice. <laughs> He's <laughs> on the road. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very well, good. It, what's actually kind of interesting mm -hmm. is most of the tracks of Southern California are contracted. So you are not allowed to sh shoot the photographs that we photograph because of safety regulations, because of our insurance that we have with the track. We have like specialty insurance just so we are allowed to photograph as close as we are to the track and stuff like that. So there are a lot of people that will like go and think they can do photography like that, but we will shut down the track. <laughs> we actually have a little bit more leeway than just a magazine photographer or anything like that. I have direct contacts with like the head of safety and stuff. And like, I am sitting there talking with the officials that are running the track and everything. So I can like tap on a shoulder and be like, Hey, that person over there that's standing in the field, they're not with us. And they go, so what are they doing here? I don't know. And I've seen them shut down a track before. So. Wow. wow. You've got a hot line to the big cheese. Power. Okay. Wow. That, that's a lot changed because I remember uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was working for Stock Car Magazine, and I'd cover races at Ascot in Riverside at the time. And I had full access pass. I could go any place I wanted to on the track. And I can remember being on the inside of turn six at Riverside and watching cars fly by me. And I was there for NASCAR and uh, the GP races. And then uh, Ascot, we got sprint cars going by us in the dirt. And I can remember one time – now – you got to go back in time because I'm old and uh, we actually used 35 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. I was so excited. The first time I went out, I kept shooting, even though I'd run out of film and I just stayed there looking through the lens, watching the cars go by. And it was just, it was, it was exhilarating. It was, you know, that's, you think what I do, I call a job. This is, <laughs> gosh, that'd be I, great. I very much enjoy it. Now, I, um, is there any possibility of you showing us some of uh, an example of something you've shot? So these are some of the photos that I've been taking this weekend. Um, they are from inside sweeper at Button Willow. And this is the fast group of a group riders. And it's my job to, to stand at the corner of a, a turn as they, they drag me coming through the turn. So, wow. Yeah. I've always loved watching motorcycle racing, especially this type of racing. I was a fan of, of uh, now I can't remember his name, Kenny. Um, mental blank. Anyway, he was a, the world champion in Grand Prix motorcycles for a number of years, was a Southern California guy. But uh, you know who also did this? Suzuki. Yeah. You know who no. also did this? Who? Christy Lee. Really? Oh, I yeah, that's she right. She also did motorcycle racing. And she, yes. I remember the first time I had her on uh, talking about cars, She we talked about what that pad is on the knee and the, that whole thing. That's, that's nice. yeah. Yeah, so you're talking about right here, there will be those things called pucks. Yep. Right. You'll see it exactly. over here, that, that bright yellow piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the, – you can tell how good of a writer is by how much of a puck he has. Yeah. <laughs> So what you're saying is uh, more puck, a good rider, less puck, you're grinding it to the ground and practically tearing your kneecap off, so you're, you're touching it a lot. You are a top rider. Uh, you're really it's pushing. Basically the am I close? It's basically oh, is it? the opposite of that. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. The better so, rider, no puck. So yeah, the kind of better the rider, up. the more time he's actually spending leaning the bike far enough over mm -hmm. where he's touching me. 
uh, a very inexperienced rider will take a turn almost straight up, and those knee pucks will never touch the ground. Yeah. Okay. So very this is where pucker counts. Yes. Yeah, and and they're also replaceable, so they yeah. they will go meanwhile, ahead. And, meanwhile, somebody's tuned in in the middle of this, going hockey. What the hell are they talking about hockey? Okay, boys? yeah, this is a car show. <laughs> So, so you're covering the button willow that's an scca owned facility isn't it yes yes it is okay that was started up uh i remember when they started as a matter of fact the original manager of the track used to be the drag strip manager at famosa raceway warren mm -hmm. smith he had left nhra he was a, an area director took over uh famosa raceway when nhra operated the track and then okay. nhra uh and he didn't see eye to eye. Button Willow had just been built, and he went over there to become the track manager there when they first opened it up. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, Warren's no longer with us anymore, but he was one heck of a nice guy. I worked with him uh, at Famoso a number of times and uh, at other events as well for NHRA. He was a, a good guy. But this is interesting to watch these bikes, especially when you've got the – when you're showing them leaning over so far. I guess he yeah. he just hit the straight and he's having fun. Yeah, so that is actually a specific bump that you don't notice on a car. It's known as wheelie bump. And let me see if I can get – let's see if I overshot somebody. Okay. Like, if you go to our website, you can go, and it will show you every track that we do here, or do in California, if not more. If you look right here where you can kind of see that horizon, right. all that is is a small arc in the road. And right there, if uh, someone decides to, they can chop throttle, and it will actually bring up their front wheel in a power wheelie. And there are people that will run that through. It, it's a fairly short front straight even. And, yeah, so right here you can kind of see how it will dip. Yeah, right after yeah. the rumble yeah. strip right there. And that's that's known as wheelie bump, and it's always a a classic shot for people who have very few photos of them getting getting their front wheel up because it's a great power wheelie. So you can see right here that'll be someone coming through that'll be dragging knee, and mm -hmm. then they come over around here and then up through this hill. So, but you say it doesn't affect the cars very much though when they go on the track. Uh, it's because it's such a small bump that it, it it's more of the bank of the inside of this turn. As it starts to flatten out, it comes up over this hill. For bikes, it's enough to to bring up a wheelie. For cars, it it's not noticeable. Okay, it doesn't upset them at all. That's that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. That is cool. You got some great perspective there. And again, if you'd like one of these shots and you would like to go on their website. It is where you go. To, there we go. Cali Photography. Yep. And you can contact them. You can pick out the, the photo you want. And they will look at that. PayPal, Discover, MX. We do our best to make it easy to like it. I love the good photos. There you go. That's cool. Yeah. And one thing that we are able to do at the track, but sadly not online yet, is we actually will do video as well. So we will do video and photography at the same time. So over this turn specifically, we will get a turn where we will get a video of someone coming over this hill as they're leaning down, and we will actually do a slow-mo video for you at the track. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. All right, now you're showing us a lot of motorcycles. <laughs> Is there a possibility of you showing us a couple of car shots? Yeah, absolutely. Um, these will be... Uh, points where you can actually rent out time on the track with a, a run group. Right. So these aren't necessarily points where you're actually renting out a car, but these will be people bringing in their own stuff. So like this Lotus, that'll be someone who has a Lotus who brought it to the track, to do a track day event and do, get the practice in. So let's see. Yeah, so you'll see more setup cars like this. 
mm-hmm. where that's someone who tracks their car much more often than, let's say, maybe necessarily this BMW. Right. But they're all, all, all of this is the, the high end group that's running there. So this will be the, the short track for Willow Springs up on the hill. Uh, right over here is actually the, the oval asphalt track. Okay. So, yeah. Now this car I can see has got a roll cage in it. So yeah. He is definitely, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a, a stealth car. Yeah, so well, this whole group for, so with this event, they have them broken down by their groups, broken down by color. Mm-hmm. So red, orange, purple, blue, and black. Those will be different grade of racers. Red is usually people that are actually racing. Black will be maybe like first time first time doing a track event. Okay. Rookie. So that same corner, but with a different group. Oh, there we go. Corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again. Wait, was that a minivan? No, it was a Volkswagen <laughs> GTI. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take the glasses off. Obviously, yeah, these aren't working. The mini. Okay. Now, uh, th- that'll be more of a lemons race if you're going to see a minivan. I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 24 hours of lemons, yes. Uh, Z06 Corvette, there we go. That was actually one of the first events I had ever shot by myself. Okay. Nissan, Z. Was the 24 hours of lemons. Really? Oh, we're, we're, fun. Yeah. <laughs> Which track did they have that at? Was uh, it there, Willow? It was. Yeah. yeah we. Let's see. They They've had it there that. for, God... I think six years now. Okay. Six or seven years. That that's been the the home track for the twenty four hour. All right. I got threatened to go out there one time, and I almost did. Uh, I had I had their organizer on uh, on speed scene one time, and it it sounds like a kick. You know, it's it's more fun than it is hard competition, but it, it's neat to watch some of the cars that go out there. Ah, uh, you have to say bring that. Them back. Well, it's. You haven't got the the cars are fully prepared, but they are not your normal cars <clears throat> in any cases. No, definitely not. You know what? Um, if the Duda parade met the twenty four hours of Le Mans, yeah, that's it. I believe you probably <laughs> have, have lemons. Yeah. Lemons, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And Bob, yes. I have information that Berkeley and you have something in common. What's that? Uh, his daily driver is something like you used to have. Oh, well, that leaves it. That, that oh, makes, the that, HHR? No. I mean, otherwise, no. it's it, that, no, that that's opens almost it up. legitimate wheels. That's almost legitimate. Oh, okay. Legitimate. Well, that was one of my normal cars. I didn't that's have a normal any of those. Car. Yeah. Maverick? No. No, no, no even worse it, than that. Don't tell him. Don't tell him. Let him guess. <laughs> Come on, Bob. Yeah. Is it is it a four letter word? Yes. Ford? A falcon? Yes, it is. All right. There we go. Okay. Early or late? Square or round? Uh, 61 wagon. All okay. right. Two-door oh, or four-door? Uh, four-door. Six-cylinder awesome. still? Did you put a V8 in it yet? So right now it has a, a six, but I went ahead and threw in a high-compression head. Okay. It's got the 200 out of the 65 Mustang. That'll work. It's got flat top pistons. Mm-hmm. Um, Sounds like uh, what you did. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a, a new cam with it, and it's 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 getting there. Right, right, right now. When you say high compression head, did you go to the cross flow, or did you just uh, take No, some... I couldn't find a cross flow. Okay. I, I went with find the, that out, right? I went with the later year head with it. Okay. Yep, did the Sounds same thing. That's investigative with... journalism, huh, Randy? Yep. Give me a something. Yeah, Peggy and I started the SoCal Falcon Club about twenty okay. years ago. Yeah. So I was the first president. I left the club. She became the president, and uh, Patrick Hall now runs it. He's out of uh, Simi Valley, California, and I built. Uh, there was a website for six Ford six cylinders, and based on the information, I built a six cylinder for my Ranchero. It was a two hundred inch. I had a sixty three Ranchero. We went a two hundred inch. 
It was standard bore when we took it apart, so we just went over one size. It was 20 over, I think. Took mm -hmm. 40 off the deck, 40 off the head. I used the cylinder head off a late model 200, so it had bigger valves. And I put yeah. a Holly Weber two barrel on it, although I had a three carburetor set up for it, but I never put that on the car. A header <laughs> and a T5 five speed. Okay. And it was you know, uh, nice. That, right now, I'm yeah, actually great, looking right? into the T5. Yeah, it's great. Uh, use the T5 from the six cylinder. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, you can use an S10 because it'll put the shifter in a better place. Or you can use the one out of the uh, six cylinder Thunderbird. It's got a bigger okay. input shaft and a better bearing setup. You've got to shorten the shaft about uh, half an inch because it's longer, but it gives you a better first gear. It's a heavier input shaft bearing, and it, it works just great. I, I had uh, an 8-inch rear end, and I put Granada disc brakes on it, on mine, plus that 5-speed. That thing was sweet, a 272 ISKI cam. And, uh, and it, that, it, folks, is your automotive section. That's the automotive <laughs> part of today's show, yeah. <laughs> that's the technical stuff today. That's and by the, way, me in. by the way, <laughs> yeah. happy birthday to Ed Iskadarian. Ed yeah, yeah 99. 99. 99. 99. Yeah, how about them apples? And this is the first year they haven't done his birthday party up in Kern County. Well, they usually mm -hmm. don't do it until, like, September anyways. Yeah, we went up there one time, but we got turned away because the they had everything fire was on fire. There. So we got as far as Mojave and had to get turned back. But uh, mm -hmm. it's a, a character. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually wearing my Smokers t-shirt. I see it's that. from represent. Represent. Yeah. Yep. Represent. Yep. Smokers started from Oso Raceway. Absolutely. The fuel and gas champions became the March meet. So. So he's still finding photos there. Now, to put this in perspective right now, the only one who's not a Ford owner in this group that's watching is Randy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have owned a Ford before. It's not like. My wife owns a Ford. She owns yeah. a Ford Escape. That's, that's true. true. My wife does right. own a Ford Escape. Hey, that's true. That's true. That's true. Guilt, yeah, by it's, guilt by association. Driveway. Yeah, it's it's in the driveway. So yeah. I guess and the by... only reason you own a Ford is because I have a Ford. No, I've got the fifty seven. Well, that was by default. I bought it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's ours anyways, right? Yeah, honey? it's ours, yes. Dear. <laughs> Couldn't get it off his finger. Come on. Ooh. Ooh. All right, there we go. Twenty four hours of Lema lemons. lemons. Look at some of these cars. Awesome. He's these are definitely more lemons than lemons. Yes. Um, <laughs> but these guys are definitely racers for what they are. Yep. So, yeah. like this car, I think it's a... Um, Sentra. Yeah. Yeah, Nissan Sentra. Yep. And if I remember right, they wrapped this entire car... <laughs> like the Jason mask. Really? Yeah. And that that's kind of what they do is they make a very, very funny race cars. Yeah. Um there's some high dollar cars right there. I mean, yeah, Corvette. Yeah, yeah. Well to Although give you an idea, the idea is that when you guys enter the race, the car cannot be valued over five hundred dollars. Right. Oh, so okay. people will buy a Porsche, let's say, and there will be someone restoring a wrecked one and they'll chop off the back of the roof and sell that. Mm -hmm. That goes back into the value of this car. So now this car only costs them 1500 bucks. Oh. And then they sold the roof for another grand for some, somebody in a wrecking yard. And then the other rule is that safety equipment is not considered part of the expenses. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because if you have a $500 car, you're running wheel to wheel, like you still need a roll cage. Yeah. And you can spend 500 bucks on a roll cage super easy. Mm -hmm. Still need seat belts too. Yeah. yeah. You got to have seat reliable belts, right? seat belts at that. <laughs> yeah. You got to have a fire suit and a proper, yeah. an appropriate helmet. Yeah. And that's a proper helmet's almost $200 easily now. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'll have to go see that sometime. Uh, so one thing about this event is there are probably close to a hundred cars on track at any given time. 
that's one of my favorite things about this is because it's let's see if we can give Sounds you guys like chaos. Oh, it yes. absolutely is. Well, not to plug someone else, but Jay Leno was a driver in one of these at Sears Point. I believe it was. Uh, oh. About a year or two ago. Uh, I think Travis were, Pastrana was, was as well, I believe. Yeah. So some, some, you know, some heavy hitters, and I guess you can call Leno a heavy hitter. He tends to hit walls and ground. <laughs> hey, I'm sure you can do any better. <laughs> heavy under the glass. No. Heavy under glass, yes. He, he was able to uh, check out the roll cage integrity. Of course, he wasn't driving, but uh, that's all right. Oh, look at this one. Here, a Mazda with a hat, wearing a sombrero. Yes. I've actually seen that. Oh, wait. So this guy. Ay, 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 ay. He's been running with lemons for as long as I've ever seen them. And I don't know if he's ever placed in terms of the Enduro, but he's always been fast. <laughs> and actually, in this photo, you can kind of get an idea of how many cars there are. Less than a car length behind them. Yeah. And then in the background, you can yeah. see three other cars there. Of course, the big question, was the hat there at the end? It's always been there every year. <laughs> I, I think that's his aerodynamic device. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah, Randy, this that's something more of an aerodynamic device. Yeah. That? <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's the air style air conditioner or what? Yeah, that's it. We used to have those hanging off. You the know what? That, if they did do an old style air conditioner, it would probably make the, the value of the value car too much. much. Oh, yeah. So it's okay, probably so cardboard. It's I was going to say it's probably a coffee maker or something, and they intravenous it into him so he stays up all night. That, that could be, be, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Berkeley, where do they contact you again to uh, get a photograph, see this website, check out some of the photographs? Now, obviously, we're looking. All right. Calliphotography.com. Connect them there and, uh, you know, get some great pictures. Take a look at the site. They've got it from serious racing to 24 hours of lemons. And check yeah. it out. Motorcycles, cars. Look at all the tracks he goes to. I think uh, one of the best tracks, though, Sonoma. That's got some of the, the most meanest turns and such. And uh, check it out. NASCAR runs there, SCCA. You can see a variety of cars. And I saw when you were scrolling through there, PCA, the Porsche Club of America. Mm -hmm. has their events at Willow Springs and Button Willow. And you can check that out there. And Fontana as well. There you go. Absolutely. All right. Oh, a Viper. Look at that. And Miatas. This is where your stepson needed to be watching. Yeah, he probably will. Actually, we, do, we need to, do we need to give him any ideas? Oh, he already has a roll cage in his. Okay, so he's going to be going. convertible. And now that he's moved back to uh, New Jersey or New York, he's going to be going up to uh, Connecticut. I run. shouldn't say he has a roll cage in it. He has yeah. he has a little cage in the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in it and stuff. No, he's already he's already gone. He's already gone. Just in time for uh, that storm that just came through New Jersey uh, a week ago, something like that. It's good. good. Breaking him in right, getting him used to the area. <laughs> and oh, the humidity. All right. Yeah, definitely the humidity. Berkeley, thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. And this will be on YouTube for you. Cali Photography. Where you can get the pictures you want of the cars that are racing out there. And if you your car is out there, you know who to contact. Or if you want to get a picture of a car that represents yours or a motorcycle, contact Berkeley at Cali Photography. Berkeley, Thank you're you welcome to, uh, to stick in and watch along with us. But uh, I think it's time we talk to, to Craig about Service Tech. And he's one of our newest sponsors here at Gas, the Great American Auto Scene. And you were talking to me earlier, Craig, about uh, a new type of battery maintenance machine or, or charger, but it's not really a charger. Tell us a little bit uh, about it, that. It's a battery cleaner, basically, a maintainer. It, uh, it's a little different. You guys have seen them at the car shows. I picked them up about seven years ago, and I thought it was just a great product. And uh, I've always had problems, you know, that stock Mustang I had with the blower on it. <laughs> and they go back to, uh, and uh, three computers running, you know. So I couldn't get it started all the time. And I'd go out and I'd have Brand X on there, which everybody's got, and they work. 
except for what happens is, is that battery, it gets charged up to 100% with any battery charger, and then as soon as it gets to there, it shuts off. When it shuts off, it sulfates. When it starts to sulfate, that's that part of the battery you don't get the use of anymore. And it does that enough that the battery doesn't come back, and that's where you buy a new battery every couple of years. I was so fortunate that I got to buy my battery every year. <laughs> so I've got one in there right now. I've had it in there for seven years, or five years, excuse me, on that one. And uh, I like the product so much that I called them up, and I've been begging them to set us up as a distributor for them. And so we finally got it. All the details are set up for service tech. And uh, we got it, and I've sold so much product in three days, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I've got you know, huge orders right now for this stuff because he's gonna, everybody owns something. They either have you know, ATVs or they have a car sitting in the, at home they don't get to use, like my Mustang. You know, the stock Mustang out there, I started up about every four months. And uh, with this, I can tell what it is. It gives me what condition the battery's in. So if it's 20%, 30%, whatever it is, it says right on it. And you'd be shocked at what happens to a battery. How many people have gone out and they've had, had their car jump started and they thought, I'm going to take that car and I'm going to drive it because it starts. And, uh, oh, it does really well, except for it only puts two amps per hour in on an alternator. It's not meant to charge your car. And what ends up happening is you've got a 750 amp or bigger battery. How many hours are you going to have to drive to charge that back up? Okay. So what this does is this brings it up. So this is the pulse system. And it brings it up to 100%. And then it pulses the battery. And it actually melts all that uh, I can't think what to call it anymore. I'm getting old. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, it melts it off and puts it back into the electrolyte. So it calcifies. Decalcifies or whatever? Or is that yeah, what you're saying? exactly what it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what ends up happening in these batteries is you'll get one that charges up so, uh, <clears> you know, you get a battery tender on there and they work for a while. But then you go to start your car and it doesn't want to start. With these things, we've got them with LCDs on them, so it's like crystal. And you can see exactly what condition you're in. And you can even unplug the unit and check your starter. You can check your charging system. You can check everything with this. Wow. Hmm. And it's, it's an automatic system. You plug it on, leave it on, and it cleans the battery all the time. So I just did my forklift at the warehouse. My forklift is the worst thing because it gets driven two weeks, and it's off for a month. And then it's two weeks again. It just gets driven really hard. We end up putting a couple batteries a year in it. So I put this, I put one on it the other day, and it was at uh, 40%. But it said it had 12.7 uh, volts in it. Well, it turned it over, but it wouldn't start it. So we just put one of the smallest battery tender or battery savers on there we could get. It's a 10 watt. It's already up to 80%. It's got 14.4 volts in it. Okay. So it makes a big difference in it. And you would be surprised what happens when you have low voltage in a battery for the rest of the components in your car. Your switches, your lights, all this stuff, your alternator have to work twice as hard, and that's where you start burning up components. Okay, you know, yeah, and I noticed that too. We, uh, the Plymouth is, my Plymouth has been in the garage since September. We finally got it out last week, and I had charged the battery for about 35, 40 minutes, started it up, no problem, took it around the block, drove fine, shut it off, closed the garage, car wouldn't start. Yep. Uh, luckily, we went on a 50-, 60-mile cruise this Saturday, and it finally got charged after two hours of driving. So now it's it fires up. But still, that's a situation that, uh, that I've got to look at because we've got our cars parked in the garage, and uh, we don't get them all out all the time. And they're yeah. on what? Service tech lifts. <laughs> Yes, yeah, we're on service tech lifts. We really appreciate that too. Yeah. Now that, that's another thing. Now, the service tech's not just the little battery chargers. You've got everything necessary for a shop. All the equipment necessary. And how Craig and I met is when we opened, when we bought our garage, we had to store our cars. To store the cars, I wanted to put them on lifts. I used to run an equipment program for Nissan a number of years ago, and the best-selling lift was a Challenger lift. Now, there's other lifts out there, and 
they're all in about the same price range, but the quality, I wanted one that I knew was going to pick the cars up and I'm not going to get stuck with a car up on the lift. They're reliable. They're, they're not hobbyist style, but they're a ho- it's a hobbyist type lift in that it's not the big expensive dealer style lift, but it's built with the same quality. And People make mistakes, Bob, on these lifts. They see the cheapest lift out there and they think they're getting a deal because it's cheap. It isn't necessarily cheap. The other problem is, is you know, I'm a lift inspector too. I'm, a, I'm nationwide. Okay, I'm, I was one of 12 for a long time and uh, federal. So I come in and I inspect the cities and the states and all this for safety. So we look at our stuff a little differently than other people do. Remember when you wanted to put it up? I said, I won't put it up unless we bold it down. Right. Yeah, because, because we, we initially were talking about, you know, they were talking about, oh, you can move this lift around. It's on wheels and you can position yep. it any place you want. And after we, you, you gave me the parameters. You told me what to do, what not to do, how to do it right. And we did. We bolted them in place. Yeah. Yep. So it, we use uh, the Simpson strong ties on yours, which are like, I don't know, they're 40,000 pound pull out each. Okay, it's way overkill. The problem is when you don't bolt these down, and, you know, Mother Nature comes around and has a little bit of an earthquake, 4,000 pounds in there, they tend to want to come down off those real fast. Or somebody bumps one of the columns when they're moving it around with a, lift, with a vehicle on there. Uh, I do safety inspections, but I also do accident investigations. And, uh, you know, I'm told that there's 2.6 fatalities every month. That's mm-hmm. not the guys out here in the, in the uh, you know, mom, the little – this is only OSHA counted. So if you were working in a shop or something, we count those. But we don't count the home use. There's a lot more things happen there. Near misses, everything. You don't want that. So there's lifts out there, and these lifts tend to be either a lift that's uh, work rated or one that's a car stacker. And guys get this mixed up. They see car stackers, and they want to work under that lift. A lot of times they don't have the safety them. They haven't been tested or certified, <clears throat> excuse me, by uh, ALI or ETL or any of these people. So you don't know what you're getting. And that's why we try to stay involved with this all the time. Now we may not get all the sales, or we don't get, you know, but what we do is we try to, you know, make the guy really informed about what they're buying. You know, we're not a PO box at Service Tech. We've been there for almost 40 years, and uh, we've been putting up lifts. Every year we do it for government, state. I mean, I even built the engine rooms for the F-35 uh, jet fighter motors. And, uh, so we do a lot of stuff. We come out and we try to be professional. But when you bought your lift, what did I do with you? Well, we okay. discussed the what lift, what positions, and everything about it, and how I was going to use it before you let me specify which lift I wanted. Exactly. And then we came out once we put it up. And then we worked with you to make sure you understood all the parts of that lift so that you'd have a good experience. And uh, a lot of these lift companies now that you see they're on the internet, what's happening is the people will buy that lift because it's cheap. Well, you get it off the truck. <laughs> okay. It's a little bit of a hassle getting it off the truck. And when there's a problem, you call up the guy on the internet and see if he'll take care of you. And then call the guy, you know, at the factory level and see what they're going to do for you. We do it all. Yeah, yeah. We're right there for you the whole time. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things you know, we try to state. Um, we're not, you know, this uh, company that's in you know, a P.O. box and say, hey, I don't know who you are, you know, after you. Right. Uh, service tech's always been that way. We supply lifts for dealerships, the big stuff. I mean, we do it for the ports. We put up, uh, uh, we got one down at the port down here in Long Beach. It's uh, 175,000 pounds. Uh, we build those things all the way along. And our crews aren't, you know, I put it this way, but the Home Depot boys. You know, yeah. this, is, this is the real deal. These guys are trained. They could, they could come out, and we don't slap a lift up. How long did it take us to put up your lifts, Bob? You were there. You guys were there all day. You started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you didn't finish till after 5 o'clock that evening. Exactly. But everything was working when you left. Yep. I mean, everything was fine. We tested them. You trained me on how to operate it. And uh, you we worked me. And I, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, Peg could operate the lift just as well. We know yeah, what to look for when it goes up. We know how to how to lock it in place. 
uh, we were fully trained and, and rated for that lift. And I, it's not that I was a newcomer to lifts, but well, you were. Of, no, but it was a lot of things that you gave, a lot of information you gave me that helped and uh, made me safer in operating it. Mm -hmm. That's our whole, you know, message. That's why I'm an inspector. That's how that all started. And they told me I was crazy as, uh, you know, uh, anyway, to get into that <laughs> program. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was crazy to get into it. But uh, you have to pass engineering tests and you have to do a lot of uh, crazy stuff to be an, in to be an inspector. Um, so what we did is I brought that to a, it's like wheel chocks on a four post lift. Nobody, you know, nobody tells you you have to have wheel chocks on there. Nope. Well, what happens when it rolls off and rolls over your family member or whatever? You know, gee, I wish I had that on there. Yeah, no. It depends on the family member, but it's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi-oh! <-ho. laughs> oh, yeah. You are correct, sir. Yeah. Andy, you got to work with this, huh? <laughs> oh, he, ex he expects something like that during one of our broadcasts, at, at least. See, See, we actually switch roles on my show. He's the one from the shouting cat calls at me. So it, it works out fine yeah. every so often. <laughs> Good car guy, get bad car guy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. but we're all car guys and, yeah. and gals because Peg's watching yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, she's a car person. and you know, I, I consider part of the you know, group. You know, I really appreciate what you guys do out there. I see this all the time. And I watch you. You know, your show. Uh, for me, I've been an old hot rider since the 60s, and I build my own stuff, and I work yep. on my own stuff, and for me, it's like, you know, my neighbor over here, Jose, has got a 66 Chrysler. It's not a great car, but I go over there and work on it with him every night, and wow. he just loves it, you know, because I like doing this. This is my, and I got into this because I like cars, and I like car people. So keep it up, Bob and Randy. Thanks. And Peg, because Thank you. So he's doing. got a C body or what? The Chrysler. No, he, he, well, the, your neighbor. What? Yeah. It's what a Chrysler? 440 with a you know it's a you know it's a what is it a Chrysler? Big, big Oh yeah, it's a monster. New I Yorker mean, maybe or? Yeah, no, no. Newport. I just know it's a 440 motor with okay. a torque by transmission. Okay. <laughs> May and I'm motor guy. You know. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I'm looking at this thing, and I'm going, and my neighbors all come over, and they look at me being crazy, because I'll have a perfectly good car sitting there, and oh, my car quit running a while back, the Mustang, the blown Mustang, so I took the car and uh, had it painted, <laughs> took it all apart, and had it painted, and said, well, oh, it doesn't run, I said, well, I needed a paint job. <laughs> You so, needed a paint job to run. <laughs> yeah, so I put the paint job on it, ran perfect. You say that like it's a bad thing. What is that? <laughs> well, the paint job was pretty nice before. Yeah. yeah. But, I, I, but I just went through it again. I didn't tell anybody that I rewired the car and built my own harnesses for it. Ah. When, Mar when Marlon comes yeah. back, we'll have so when Marlon comes back, we'll have you tell him about it. He had a beautiful '65 or '66 Mustang until someone decided they needed to make a left turn in front of him. Oh. Aww. And Marlon hasn't had his Mustang since. Marlon, uh, Craig's got a great Mustang. You may have even seen it. Craig, can you describe the car to him? Yeah, it's a it's a bone stock '64 and a half Mustang convertible, and yeah. it's a, yeah, except for the the uh, blown motor up under the hood and the nine inch in the back and the four <laughs> and the uh, five speed and the is it still computer. teal and white? Huh? Oh, it's turquoise. Kind of turquoise, turquoise and white, yeah. Yeah, it's mom's go to the beach car is what it looks like. It's got white interior, and it looks like you know it's that ultimate sleeper. So I don't think that five speed. tuned it down to four hundred and forty at the rear wheels, and uh, it puts four sixty torque out at uh, nineteen hundred RPM. Yeah, that ain't bad. Just a little. Hmm. Just a little. All right, so yeah, how would you, yeah you've got you've got a website and you're you're on Facebook. How do people contact you, Craig? Because uh, you know, if they want service equipment, whether it's the drain to drain the oil out, to the lifts, to the, the jacks, to even the, the chocks to stop the wheels. Yeah. Battery tender, yeah. The battery. Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm going to make you a deal here, Bob. Okay. So for the rest of the month, anybody calls us up for one of those battery savers, 10% mm -hmm. uh, off. It, but they got to tell us it's for, you know, the car guys. Okay. They gas. got gas. Right. Gas. If they don't tell us, they're not getting the deal. So okay. Okay. We'll get we'll get that up. Uh, 
I'll get with you afterwards. We'll get some more information. We'll do a yeah. we'll do up an ad for you. And I'm we'll, gonna do better than that, Bob. I'm gonna give you one to try. Too. All right, even great. Good. I can with the cards we got. We need them. But uh, yeah. wait, there is more. There's more. <laughs> Man. All that right. We are now, but what we're going to do now is the fun part because Ford has come out with the Bronco again yeah. and their target is Jeep and they've hit the mark really well. As a matter of fact, they've hit the mark with more technology than the Jeep has, more horsepower, and it's kind of a retro look version of the original Broncos, but they've got a four door and they've got a two door. They've got hard tops. They've got soft tops. V6 twin turbo. More horsepower than the Chrysler, than the Jeep has. But the rumor is Jeep is going to go one up on them and put the Hemi in the Gladiator. There's a picture of it. I've got some minute. pictures, too. Yep. You never have too much horsepower. Never, never. That's the, uh, that's the. The dashboard looks good. Yeah. yeah. There you go. You're going through it. It's wow. a modern adaptation of the original Bronco. Now, if you go back in time, the Jeep had the market sewn up. The CJ series of Jeeps uh, had been taken over by Kaiser after World War II. Ford didn't want anything to do with the Jeep, although they were one of the manufacturers during World yeah, War II nice. of the Jeep. But they didn't want any part of it. They didn't see the need. They didn't see the market until they finally realized Jeep was getting bigger and better every year. Now, Jeep went through a number of iterations. It became part of American Motors as Kaiser went out of business. Then Chrysler took them over, and Ford came out with the Bronco. Now, the Bronco was not an answer necessarily to the Jeep as much as it was an answer to the International Harvester Scout, which was more stylized, much like the Bronco was. It had a four-cylinder. It had a six-cylinder. It had a V8. It was four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive. Now, Bronco came out, and Chevrolet then came out with the Blazer. Bronco's back, and it's a true off-road vehicle, four-wheel drive. It's got two different drive systems coming up, one really made for off-road, and one that will be an off-road and street version with transfer cases, 10-speed automatic transmission, six-speed manual with an ultra-low granny gear, and the ability to climb rocks. Now, it's back. Scout is gone. Chevrolet has come back with a blazer. It's a car. Chevrolet is going to be catching up. Chevrolet has been doing this all their life. They couldn't come up with the Camaro in time. Mustang beat them to the market. Three years later, GM came out with a Camaro and then the Firebird. Chrysler, well, they tried with the Barracuda, and it was technically the first pony car coming out two weeks before the Mustang did. And I'm so old. I saw the Mustang introduced at the New York world's fair in 1964. And uh, yeah, I'm old. Yes. And, but it was great. That, that car was an instant hit. Marlon, you deal in Fords. You were president of, uh, of the Ford club there in Southern California in this, in the Valley. What's your take on the new Bronco? Looks pretty good from what I've seen so far. Comes with the, uh, Turbo four cylinder or a turbo right. charge six, but I heard that the turbo charge six only comes with a uh, ten speed automatic. Uh, no, uh, that could be. I, I was reading some information, and obviously, the press information so far is not completely accurate. They haven't released all the information on the car yet. The four cylinder is two hundred and seventy horsepower. Yeah, and the uh, V six turbo is three ten. Yeah, so there's a lot of horsepower, more torque and more horsepower than any version of the Jeep at this point. But then again, like I said, they're making noises at Chrysler that they're going to put the Hemi, the V8, in the Jeeps. And we'll see how that works. And don't know if Ford's going to step up with a V8 version of the Bronco. But looking at the photographs... That's going to be a tough fit because the Ford V8s at this point in time are very wide with their overhead cam designs. Yeah, the five liter. Yeah. Although, is that just what they need is is sticking a Hemi in a Jeep to go uphill? I mean, yeah. is that does that make any sense at all? For an off-roader? Yes, it does. Okay. If you're going to... If you're going to rock climb or you're going to climb that hill, I mean, there's hill climbs and you put it in, in basics. Their hill climbs are something that you wouldn't even be able to walk up. 
and people are doing this in cars. So getting that horsepower down to the pavement is going to require some good tires and suspension, but horsepower is the name of the game, whether it's drag racing or off-road. I think tires would become a major uh, option. And, yeah. and there is an, the, the, the photograph. Yeah, the photographs I've seen of the off-road version or the uh, the the more off-road version, they're huge tires. A lot of sidewall. I, I saw some of the stock trim Broncos. They they had some pretty decent tire and wheel options on there. Yeah, and as with the uh, previous model Broncos, or the first generation, the doors come off and expose the side of the vehicle. Yeah. So it's uh, you know like an off-road vehicle. Uh, they've got a convertible top and two hard tops available in two door and four door version. So there, it's gonna it's gonna be looking pretty good. Uh, we'll see how it goes. This is a retro vehicle. When Ford's been coming out with retro vehicles, they did the two-seat T-Bird, was pretty well-received. It was real expensive, though. I think in this case, they've learned their lesson, and the Bronco will be affordable. Yeah, there's the two-door version, and it's cool. And that's with the off-road tire package. What's the suspension on these? Uh, they haven't talked about that much, but it's supposedly very compatible with off-road with the off-road package. So there's going to be a street version that's got narrower tires, but what he's shown you is the ones with the big fender flares, huge tires, and a lot of suspension travel, which is what these guys need. I can see them hidden to Pismo or the Rubicon area and uh, really show it off what they can do. More torque at the lower RPMs. That That's the one right there that really looks yeah. cool. That's I don't know what it is with the open area in the side door there, but... Uh, you know, I can hold that a little steadier. So you can see that rock you're hitting, I guess. I don't know. I guess so. Look out the side at the cliff. Yeah. Just before you roll. That's it. So Ford's coming back out with the Bronco. Randy, you and I are not off roaders. I know my son is a heavy duty off roader. I don't know where he got that. I, he certainly didn't get it from me. But, you know, and you question whether or not you need the horsepower. But what would you see is a, a competitor for this new Bronco? Well, uh, basically, if you take a look at, we've talked about, uh, I think the interesting thing about this is the different Broncos they have. It seems like they have so many models coming out in this. It's more than just the Bronco that Marlon was showing. They're doing a pickup truck bed in the back, kind of like a, a Gladiator in a sense. Gladiator, and you had mentioned some of the things they're doing to improve that. I saw where they're, they're coming out with the Eco Diesel version now. So they're coming out with all sorts of engine designs. Chevy, if they want to get involved in this, is going to have to come up with something here pretty quick. Uh, I'm not so sure they're going to do that. And I'm interested, you know, maybe Toyota comes up with something. Maybe, well, not Honda, but I mean, there's Nissan, you know, comes up with something. Because remember, we all kind of giggled when they said um, Toyota was going to come up with a truck, a pickup truck. And yep. now take a look at the market share they have. Right. So that's possible they could come up with their own vehicle. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that they could come up with because cars are morphing all the time into trucks and and all sorts of other vehicles. I wouldn't be oh, surprised. Chevy Blazer. Yeah, well, that's the problem with General yeah. Motors. Now, yeah. the last time this happened, what General Motors did is they bought Isuzu. When the mini truck, truck craze started, General Motors bought controlling interest in Isuzu, got the Chevy Love truck. Then when the SUVs became popular, the Trooper came out. GM had Isuzu making vehicles for them, whether they were the compact vehicles or not. Peg was working for Suzuki when GM started using the Suzukis in their mm -hmm. off-road vehicle lineup. But they've never really gone hardcore. The Blazer was more of a dressed-up off-road vehicle and it sold quite well and it started to dwarf the sales of the bronco when it came out and i think it was 1972 but it, again they were late to the game as always they seem to be following ford and when they do they see the shortcomings of the ford product and every product has shortcomings and they go a step ahead when you look at the bronco versus the original uh ford or chevrolets the chevy was far and away a more luxurious and larger vehicle. And GM capitalized on the fact they used basic truck components and just a short wheelbase vehicle. So it saved them money. Ford then came back with a bigger Bronco and 
we all saw how well that did as uh, OJ went down the highway. <laughs> they had that double wishbone up there in the front of the port, and it allowed it to drop into more ruts and what have you than what that solid axle did in the front on the yeah. GM. So that's one of the reasons why that I saw anyway. I had one of those OJ Broncos. <laughs> was it white? <laughs> uh, no, I was blue. And, uh, you know, and they told me when I bought it, I had this big boat, and they said, oh, you could tell the gloves in the glove box? Yeah. You know, I saw this, and I thought this was interesting. That's OJ checking out the new Bronco. Oh, yeah. nice. That's okay. <laughs> you never know when he's going to need a getaway vehicle. I'm uh, yeah, I, just saying, you know. Well, one mm-hmm. thing about the Bronco over the Chevrolet is that shorter overhangs. So when you got off-roading and you started climbing rocks and so forth, you didn't have to worry about too much body contact, and it had a lot more ground clearance. The Bronco, though, was a more rough-and-tumble vehicle, and you came back from the, the off-roading, you just opened up the doors, turned on the hose, and hosed it out. It was mm-hmm. fine. The Chevrolet, though, that had carpeting. That had full interiors. That was more of a luxurious you know, image vehicle, but it did the job. Uh, and it sold quite well, and it dwarfed originally the uh, Bronco. Ford then was chasing Chevrolet with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the imports started coming up with things. That's when the Jeep started mm-hmm. to expand as well. Now we'll see what happens with Jeep, with uh, that being the most popular and profitable side of the Chrysler Corporation. I'm sure they're going to be making some changes, too. The Gladiator was a big hit. And has been. It's been out uh, less than a year now, I think, or just about a year. And it's making some big inroads in that there's no competition for them in that particular segment of the market. Well, I think they've got another 20 years of the Challenger design staying the same. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, I mean, how long is that going to go in the Charger design? Yeah. I mean, that's that's basically the design from 2006, for heaven's sake. So, you know, they're they're refining it and all that yeah. but uh, the challenger with the exception of the change in 2015 i think it was uh, it, they've basically been the same car so i'm interested in seeing what they come up with with that well they're both based on a mercedes chassis right mercedes is the one that designed right. the challenger charger magnum chrysler 300 and when they left the company fiat took it over you got a different mentality a european mentality is a lot different they'll run the same body styles for a decade and just do refinements that you don't see under the hood, suspension and chassis. And pretty much that's what Fiat's been doing with the Challenger. It's become mm-hmm. a very refined car. It is a good vehicle. There's no question about it. And it's still looking good, but it still looks the same. And the, they've made no improvements there. They've threatened to make a Barracuda, but that hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but as this, at this point, based on the photographs I've seen, I think the Bronco is going to be a pretty good hit. I yeah. think it's going to start in, invading the, the Jeep territory price-wise and, and amenities-wise. It's a good-looking, as although it's a retro vehicle, it's a modern-looking retro vehicle. And I think that's where it's going to gather a lot of steam, and people are going to be buying that, and the Chevy dealers are just going to be crying. Well, I, I agree with what you were saying, though. I think they're going to have to come up with something because if Jeep sales skyrocket and Bronco sales really take off, GM dealers are going to be looking at each other and going, okay, what do I get? What do I have to sell that goes into that? And uh, short of the small pickup truck and you figure out a way to do something with that, there really isn't anything. Well, you know, LS motor in it. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there, there's, there's the club Peg and I started, SoCal Falcons, and that was the original design concept that I came up with for the club logo. That's since been changed. Uh, it's all right. Patrick's the president now. And I then, think everybody's had a Falcon at one time in their life. I, you know, like and I've, had, I've had four or five along the way, and uh, the last one was my 63. And that was one of the ones I really shouldn't have gotten rid of. But, yeah, there we go. You got all the pins. I can take my collection of pins down, too, Marlon. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not saying anything. I'm not yeah. disturbing anybody. I'm just kind of no. throwing in little bits. You are. And we'll get even. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, oh, there we go. There we go. A <laughs> little bit of heaven, 94.7. Yeah. All right. We have, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, Union 70 a uh, baseball. God, yeah, I have, I have two of those, one still in a sealed bag. Oh, I was going to say, that's the one that goes on the antenna, right? 
Oh, no, no, that's a real that's baseball. baseball. Oh, a real baseball. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. That's, that's a baseball. That's a baseball. That's a baseball. That's a baseball. All right. I'll tell you what. We have gone over time, and it's been a good show. I do appreciate you all. Berkeley, thank you for being part of the show tonight. Great photographs. If you want to get in touch with oh, me, contact okay. Cali Photo. Cali Photography. Cali Photography, and you can check them out on the internet, calliphotography.com. Yep. Craig. I'm going to be putting up an ad for Craig on this great new battery pulser, and we'll get that out to you. Yep. Battery we'll saver. Be, yep. And we will get that out to you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much, guys. You are Gasaholics, and thanks for being part of Gas, the great American auto scene. You've got Gas, the evening edition. Take care, folks. <laughs>